Hi folks and welcome to the first in what's going to be a new series of videos from me. This time I'm going to be learning some more Rust and I'm going to be working through this tutorial that I found online which is focusing on writing a linked list implementations in Rust. It seems a bit of a crazy way to do things but it's something that we can do without really needing to pull in many existing libraries that are written in Rust. It's more about learning the language itself, learning the syntax, and learning how to you know, work with a compiler, understand compiler errors, fix problems that come up, all those kind of things. So I think it's a good pattern to follow. I think it's a good way of getting a real grounding in the language rather than any particular library or framework. And it should also suit me pretty well because my background is kind of embedded programming, operating systems, and low level stuff. So I've implemented linked lists in C. That was one of the ways that I learned C language, was re implementing linked lists, data structures, and kind of standard library type functions to see how, how are those things actually implemented within the language. So, yeah, this should be a pretty good way of learning for me. I'm going to work through this guide. I'll post a link to this guide in the description below the video, so if you want to check this out feel free to do so. And towards the end I will link to the GitHub repository for this as well. So if you do have any feedback or comments or issues on the actual text of the guide that I'm looking at then you can file those upstream on their GitHub. I'll post a link to that later on. So let's start having a look. This is Learn Rust with Entirely Too Many Linked Lists. So this introductory page gives us kind of an outline of what we're going to be doing. We're going to be working through a few different implementations of singly linked stack first, uh, doubly linked, double ended queue next and then what looks like some unsafe linked lists so that'll be interesting and it also gives us some instructions to create a new project using cargo so i'll do that in a second the rest of this kind of talks about you know why why are we talking about learning rust with linked lists when linked lists aren't really a great data structure for a lot of uses and I'm not going to read this all out loud. This is something you can go and take a look at if you're interested. It's got kind of all the arguments for and against linked lists in here. But towards the end, what it finishes with is, you know, they're simple, they're good for teaching. And as I say, this style should work pretty well for me. So let's dive in with this. Let's create our project. So I already have Visual Studio Code open here in my Rust projects directory. And we're going to create our new project called Lists. And this is going to be a library project. So see how that works. And then we're going to reload Visual Studio Code in the Lists directory. So here we have something we can play around with. So coming back to this guide, we need to jump into the first chapter. So we're going to go ahead and look at a bad singly linked stack. So what are we finding here? This is going to be by far the longest chapter core, cool. and it's going to introduce basically all of Rust. We're going to build up some things the hard way to better understand the language. That's that's the sort of approach to learning things that works well for me. So looking forward to getting stuck into this. So in our lib.rs file, we're going to call out a module and make it public. And that will then allow us to create a first.rs file. So let's do that. So we have lib.rs in here. And we have some existing code, we're going to get rid of this completely. And we're going to 
set this up in a Git repository so that we don't lose things. So it says no commits yet, but it has created us an empty Git repository. So all we're going to do here is add to the contents of this directory and commit this as our initial commit. And for now, that's just going to be on this machine. I'll push this up to GitLab at some point in the near future. But yeah, let's let's carry on rather than doing the GitLab setup now. Let's carry on working through our guide. So yeah, we need to add this text to lib.rs. So let's pull our shell down out of the way and let's call out pub mod first. And we likely need a file first.rs so that this will be happy. We've put this text into lib.rs. Let's jump to the next bit and see what we're talking about. So we're starting off by discussing the basic data layout for a list. And this looks like there's a few different kind of attempts in here with some compiler errors. I am going to work through all of this. I'm going to copy in pretty much all of the code that we see in this guide, even the stuff that's obviously a dead end and obviously is followed by a compiler error. And we're going to try and understand the compiler errors as we go. I want to see these actually printed on my system, not just read them in a guide. So this is our first attempt. We're going to grab this little block of code and we're going to put it into first.rs. We're going to see what happens. So it's now we've got some code in first.rs. It's took away the red underlining in lib.rs. So this seems now happy that that module does exist. But we do have an issue here. So we could compile this and see what issue gets printed. But you know, if we just mouse over this on Visual Studio Code, it says that this is a recursive type and has infinite signs. So this is an enum type in Rust. So an enum means a list object can take either of these values. And these values are kind of defined here within the data structure. They're not references to something else. So empty isn't a reference to something else. It's actually a definition of one of the possible values that a list object can have. So a list can either be empty or it can be an element, which in this case is a 32-bit integer paired with another list object. So this looks like it'd give you a linked list, but the that element there is saying that we're going to store a list in place as the second member of this data structure. So if a list object directly contains a list object, which directly contains a list object and so on, then yeah, we've got a recursive data structure that will you know never terminate. It's essentially going to be infinite in size and depth. So we can't really do that. We need this to be some sort of reference to a, another list object rather than actually trying to embed this list object directly inside a list object. So let's have another look at this. So yeah, this is saying the recursive type, as we say, and it has an infinite size. And it says it's recursive without indirection. This is kind of what we mean. We want to have some indirection. We want to have kind of a pointer or reference type here. So out of interest, let's see what happens when we try to build this. So if I do cargo build, we have this explanation again that it's a recursive type and it has an infinite size. But the compiler output is kind of a little more detailed and you know it points out exactly where in the structure this recursion without indirection is happening 
and it's got some really helpful text here saying we should insert some direction and it gives us a couple of suggestions so we can use any of these options here to make the list type representable here so we can just use a straight reference now this is where we need to actually remember how these things work in Rust so a straight reference would imply some sort of ownership here and it would imply that the object has to be allocated somewhere else we've also got reference counted and boxed types so these are ways of doing managed memory on the heap which can be allocated and can be automatically freed once we're finished with it so I'm not really too familiar with the differences between box and RC types at the minute other than to know that RC does stand for reference counted. So I'm going to also take a look at this more detailed explanation just because we can. So this is the more detailed description of this error. This is actually pretty handy. It's, uh, it's really clearly saying that you know we're missing this indirection and the example it gives is a list node which is written in a slightly different way but essentially works kind of the same and it says you know we need to use some sort of pointer here and kind of it calls out that the size of a list node is dependent on the size of a list node so this is a recursive definition and it suggests we use a box which is you know, it's a pointer type, so it's got a well-known size. So that's a pretty good description. So this guide kind of shows the same compiler output that we saw and says, let's, let's find out what a box is. And I'm just going to go ahead and take a look at this. So a box has a new function which allocates memory on the heap and places x into it. So it takes a reference type and creates a boxed version of that which lives on the heap. And then that memory will be automatically freed when the box goes out of scope. So I'm not going to read through all of this, but yeah, there is plenty of detail here in the Rust documentation on what a box is and it lives in this standard boxed crate here. And there's a good example here using the sort of cons and nil terminology which is seen quite often in functional programming languages as a way of defining a list. I think this, this kind of structure makes sense to me. It's similar to what we've got above. It's got, it's just changing this list over to a boxed list. So we should be able to do this just by putting box around our list. So we put our next reference in a box. And now we see that the red squiggly line has gone from under this definition. There's no longer an error being flagged by the analyzer. There is this warning being printed by the C spell plugin. And we're going to quick fix that by just saying add the out phrase LM to our dictionary. So this looks pretty happy. Let's cargo build. Looking good. We have a very, very basic list data structure. So what does the guide say about this? It says it built, but it's not really a great definition of a list. It's saying that since if there is an I32, we always need a box list. Then we're going to have to have if we've got two elements in our list A and B, then B is going to have to 
still reference another box list which is going to take this empty value. So this requires allocating some unnecessary memory here and it also says that the first node is going to be on the stack or going to be in place in whatever element contains our list. So if we embed this data structure in another larger data structure, so we have a list as an element of a larger data structure, then the first element will be stored in place and subsequent elements will be stored on the heap. So we've got a little bit of confusion here, kind of this, this first element isn't boxed, second and subsequent elements are boxed, and it's just nice to have things really consistent. So hopefully this is going to show us how to do things this way. So we essentially move where the where the option of having a, a, another element or not lives. So hopefully we'll end up with what's essentially just a pointer or reference on the stack or in some bigger data structure containing the list and then every element is boxed and the final element just has a a null pointer where you know Rust is gonna do the, where Rust is gonna do the job of making sure we never actually dereference that null pointer. So we've got some general discussion of layouts of enums here. I'm not going to dwell on this in too much detail. I'm going to take a look at this. So yeah, this is not a great implementation. It kind of works, but it does require kind of double definition of an element. So let's let's carry on. Let's look for something that's a bit clearer. So we've got here, we're splitting a node from a list. Cool. And this lets us have this next element of a node be empty or be a reference to another boxed node. So we've got a list which is just a reference to a node. We have a node which contains a list element and the list element is a reference to another node and then the list element in this node is null which is going to correspond to this option here of being empty. I keep using the word option because I know that we can kind of represent this using the option type within Rust. But for now we're going to stick to the way that this guide does things and hopefully later on we'll see option used to simplify things. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm actually going to just copy all this rather than retyping it. And we're going to paste that over here. So we have some warnings about fields never being read. I think that's going to be because this struct really needs to be made public. So we have, yeah, we've got an error here. And I think the guide does call this out um, slightly later on. But we're saying we're referencing a private type in a public interface. So this pub enum list is referencing a thing that isn't pub. So pub means that it's visible publicly from outside the current module. So if we're going to have something that's publicly visible and it's going to reference this node type, then the node type also needs to be called out as public. And that should hopefully give us something a little better. It's still giving us some warnings but we'll, we'll ignore those for a minute and see what the guide says. So 
So yeah, it shows that warning that we saw that we were referencing a private type in a public interface. So what have we got? Interesting. So this implementation here is all about hiding the hiding the details. So we have a pubstruct list and then we hide the implementation details in here. So let's let's see whether it, the compiler is happy with my code as it is. And we do get some warnings. So we do see field is never read. Not too sure about those. I wonder if those will disappear once we actually start adding some implementation. I think that may be because within a struct. No, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether we would need to call these out as pub or not. I'm not going to worry about that at the minute. What we're going to do is, yeah, it does it does build, it doesn't have any errors. But yeah, let's switch over to the implementation that we saw. And I'm going to write this one out. So it was pub struct list, and that contained a link. And then we change this to say link. And we drop pub off the front of these. Okay, so I'm too used to seeing semicolons inside definitions. Let's change it to a comma. And I'm forgetting that there needs to be a colon between these, the type and the name of the field found built-in attribute link. That's, ah, uh, yes, we've got this the wrong way around. So yeah, this is why I want to type this stuff in manually, because I need to get used to the differences between Rust and C. So the idea that in C the type name comes first, and then the name of the thing you're defining. In Rust it's the other way around, and there's a colon between them. So yeah, we've seen more of these Things saying variants are never constructed, fields are never read. I think that's just because we've not got any implementation details here that's actually going to use these fields and variants of an enum. So hopefully these warnings will go once we start adding some code. So what we got here? We're saying, yeah, so we could make all of the node and list stuff totally public. But generally, we favor keeping implementation details private. So yeah, we converted the list to a struct on its own that just contains a link. And we're calling it head. So let's, yeah, let's use the name they use for head. So let's, so a list in this case is a single link list, just has essentially a reference to the head node within the list. And it can be empty, or it can reference a box node that's been allocated on the heap. Cool, that kind of makes sense to me. And yeah, it's important to note in the minute we're just kind of forcing element to be a 32-bit integer to keep this code simple. So it's not really a very generic list, but it's good for a first tutorial. So looking back again at the tutorial, it does call out that we get these warnings. Good, so we're going to see what's going on. So as far as the Rust compiler can tell, everything we've written is totally useless. We never use head, no one who uses our library can since it's private. So the, the struct list is public, but the head element inside it isn't public, so we can only reference that element from within this module. Okay. So yeah, what we need to do is implement some code for our list. So looking at our next page in this tutorial, we see that we use an implementation block. So this is the code 
that influence functions on our data structure. So this is like in C++, this would be your class, your implementation in the class, rather than your definition. It's maybe not quite accurate, it's been a long time since I wrote in C++, but I kind of know what I mean. It's, it's, where, you, it's where you implement the functions once you've defined them. But in Rust, we don't need to separately define all the functions for our class. You know, this isn't really even called a class in Rust. It's a data structure. So this implementation for list is going to be a block where we can put our various functions in. So let's go and do that. Let's add an implementation block. And we'll just go ahead and put this new function in here straight away. So what we're doing is defining a public function called new that doesn't take any arguments and it returns self so the data type self is the thing that we are implementing so it's going to return a list so it's going to construct a new list where our head member is set to this empty option that we have within a link so we we have this head member of struct list which is a link and our link has two options so it can either be empty or it can be a reference to a node that is in a box on the heap so we're gonna when we create a new list we're gonna create it empty so let's go and do that now let's say implementation of list as a public function new which returns type self so if I wrote a very small amount of rust I wrote enough to kind of know what this syntax means that this is kind of the after the little arrow is where we put our return type and we don't need kind of a return keyword here, we just have an expression which evaluates to something and if that's the last expression within the block so within these curly brackets here within this block the last expression with no semicolon is essentially going to be returned so there's kind of an implicit return in here so yeah we're constructing a list and within that we're going to set the head element to link colon colon empty cool so we've got a red squiggly under our equals so it's a colon to initialize these members so that's cool we have a new function we can create a new list it's still saying the field's never read. Um, it isn't showing a warning for the empty variant anymore because we are actually using that here. Um, it's still showing warnings for the things within a node because we're not really using that at all yet. But let's see if this builds. We've got some warnings, as we say, just saying, you know, the various fields aren't read and this option here where we're referencing a box node is never actually used but that's fine for where we are because all we've done is implement a constructor that returns an empty list so yeah we've got a couple of notes here so self is an alias for I'm going to say an alias for the type that we're implementing so it's an alias for list here within the implementation block and we create an instance of a struct in much the same way we declare it. Instead of providing types of the fields, we provide values for the field. Makes sense, that's how we instantiate something. Uh, we can refer to variants of an enum using the double colon, which is a namespacing operator. So I believe that's the same as namespacing operator within C++. And then the yeah the same the last expression of a function is implicitly returned so we don't need a, a return keyword in here so long as we don't have a semicolon at the end of that 
last expression. So cool, we have something that compiles with some warnings, well, it's warnings that we understand, and hopefully we're going to implement some more functions that are going to use these various elements and start to get rid of some of those warnings. So now we've got a bit of a detour on what ownership means within Rust. So obviously ownership in Rust is one of the key features and the key things that kind of differentiates it from a lot of other programming languages. I've read a lot about the ownership model and I would definitely say if you learn in Rust go read a lot about the ownership module and reread the same thing again until you actually absorb it and understand it because it really is the one of the key things that you need to understand to be able to write Rust code and get it through the compiler. So I'm not going to go into it all here but this kind of just calls out the way that we can have a value and then we can have either a read-only reference or a mutable reference to that value. And mutable references give, represent exclusive access to a value and read-only references can be shared. So we can have as many read-only references to an object as we want provided that there are no active mutable references or we can have one active mutable reference and the ownership model and the borrowing model within Rust are the things that allow that kind of manage this for us and the borrowing model allows us to temporarily take a mutable reference and kind of put all the non-mutable read-only references on hold for a minute while we do our mutation, our changing of the state, and then once we're done with the mutable reference we can make use of our read-only or immutable references again. So that's my understanding of ownership and borrowing at the minute. And I'm not going to go into things in any more detail at this point. I want to carry on writing some code. So this first kind of chapter here that's doing our first linked list is actually referring to that linked list as a stack. So stacks are kind of a restricted version of a list. They have just a couple of options. We can push a new element on to the top of the stack and we can pop an element off the top of the stack. So with a stack we can't in insert things partway through the list, we can only insert items at the head of the list. So this is what our first function we're going to implement is, is our push function and that pushes an element onto the list, it inserts something at the head of the list, so it becomes the new head of the list. So we're going to implement this code that needs a mutable reference to a list object. It's going to be mutable because we're actually going to modify the list and it's going to be what is the value that we want to put onto our list. So our list element is explicitly a 32-bit integer. That's all we support. So if we want to add a new element, it has to be, you know, the value is going to be a 32-bit integer. So let's write this code. So yeah, this is our constructor. I'm gonna I'm gonna try writing this rather than just copy pasting at this point because I made a couple of silly mistakes before. And the trick is to kind of get some muscle memory of how how the code looks, how the code's written. So we have pub fn push. And we're going to have an and mute self, so that's going to be a mutable reference to a list type. And we're going to have the value that we want to push on, which we call an element. And that element's going to be an i32. So do we need to say what type self is? No, we don't. That's quite nice. And then after this, we have a block. So this function doesn't return anything 
new, it just modifies a reference that we're given. So we're going to create a new node first of all. And yeah, I see, I see it's kind of throwing an error here, but I'm going to go with this implementation anyway and see the error for myself. So we're going to create a new node and we're going to set element to the element argument that's been passed and we're going to set next to the head of the list. So we're going to let new node equals a node where element is the element argument and next is self dot head. So that I believe is the same code, yes. Yeah, so we're creating a new node, which is this node type here. We're setting the members and next is being set to a object of type link. Now we've got an object of type link already in self, which is the head of the list. So we can just you know, take this head and put it in next. So if, if the list was empty, then we create a node where next is empty, indicating that this is the end of the list. If there was already something in the list, then our next pointer points to whatever was at the front of the list previously. So let's say we build that. Interesting. Unused variable. Well, that's fine. We're going to use the variable later on when we've added some more code to our function. And what I've seen here is we're saying it can't move out of self.head, which is behind the mutable reference. So it's saying that we've not got any implementation of this copy trait. So it doesn't really know how to copy a object of type link. Let's see what the tutorial tells us. So it's, it's saying, yeah, the tutorial is saying it's not obvious what it means or what to do about it. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to move the what was previously head of the list into the next element of what's going to be the new head of the list. And Rust isn't too happy with us doing that. It would leave self partially initialized. So this is to do with ownership. This is to do with the fact that if we if we move this reference here into next, then it should no longer also exist in head of our list object, because then we've got two references to the same thing. We've got two things trying to say they own the same memory. So I'm not going to implement this one because it's kind of trivial. It doesn't create any new error. It just creates the same error. So um, yeah, we this is based on the idea of, well, if we invalidate next here, well, what if we just set it to something new afterwards, but that kind of leaves us this intermediate point at the end of this first statement where things aren't in a good state, and Rust doesn't want us to have these intermediate points where things aren't in a good state. It wants things to be in a good state everywhere. So what we're going to do is the what they're referring to as the Indiana Jones trick of you know swapping things without having an intermediate state where there is nothing there. So, interesting. This this looks particularly crazy. We're using a replacement function to actually 
steal the value of a borrow and replace it with another value at the same time. So yeah, this is kind of exactly doing that job of just condensing to modify like the copying the value that's in a structure out to a new node and unsetting it making that empty at the same time so we can't we can't do a replace of what was on the head of the list with our new node because this is kind of in inside the code that creates our new node so yeah we do need to when we take the head of the list because we're going to put it in the next position after our new node. So we're going to move whatever was the first node of the list out of the list and onto the back of our new node. So our list temporarily becomes empty because we've just moved the whatever was on the list over into the next reference of our new node. And then afterwards, once we've finished creating our new node, we're going to update our list again to say that the head of the list is our new node. So what we do is we've got our list and we've got some thing that is in our list. We're going to take it out of the list and we're going to put it behind our new node. And then we're going to put our new node onto the front of the list. don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, that's my kind of visual understanding of it. And this replace operation lets us do these two things at the same time. That's kind of cool. I like it. Let's see what happens. So to do that, we need to say I think it's, is it use standard mem? Okay, so we're going to use the mem crate within the Rust standard library. And here we're going to say mem replace. And we need to say that that's a mutable reference to self.head. And we're going to replace it with. An empty link. So that looks the same, yeah. So we're going to take our whatever's at the head of the list and we're going to store that in next and at the same time we're going to replace the head element of our list object with this empty value and then we're going to have a second step where we actually update self.head to be our more variant of a link which is a box of a node what are we referencing it to so new node So, cool, not quite there yet. So we need to create a new box, that's where we're going long. So we need to put this new node object into a box. Because this more option within our link and on requires a boxed node. So yeah that's the end of our implementation of the push function. So let's see what happens if we build this code. So I'm just going to bring this up to full screen terminal and plug the build. So we've got two warnings. We're saying that the element field 
and the next field are never read. It's fine. We never really look what's in the node. We set these fields when we push something onto a, our stack. But at the minute, we've got no function for retrieving any of these elements. So let's have a look what's next on our tutorial. So the next thing is pop. Now I'm going to save pop for a minute and I'm going to implement something else instead of pop. I'm going to implement a peak function. So pop gets the value that's on the top of the list and removes it from the list. Whereas a peak function just gets the element that's at the top of the list and leaves it on the top of the list. So this is going to have kind of the same signature as pop, but it's going to return the same thing, which is an option type. But it's not going to actually mutate the list. So we don't need a mutable reference. So yeah, this is interesting. This is kind of writing some of our own code as well as the code that's in the tutorial. So let's define pub function peak, which doesn't need a mutable reference. It just needs a read-only reference to our list. And this returns an option, which could be in I32 if there is any data. So what we need is we're going to use a match statement to deconstruct the possible the possible values that self that dot head can have and have different expressions for each of those. So we have match self dot head and it's either going to be empty and we have this arrow with an equal sign instead of an arrow with a dash and I believe we then have a block I'll just put to do in the middle for now and then we have the other option which is more and we need to say that when it takes this more variant here, we have a boxed node, which we're going to pull out as well. So if empty, we need to return none. So is it option? None. I think that's how we say nothing. And then I think our option has some. I'm not sure of the syntax on this. Let's kind of scroll down a little bit. So we don't need option in front, we just need to call it none and some. So if the list is empty, we return none. If the list has an element, we have some node dot. Is it node dot lm? I'm sure it's node dot lm. So we've got an error here saying consider borrowing here. So in this case, okay, so there's some interesting stuff here, but let's 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 build this and read the output from the compiler. Let's try and figure this out ourselves. So 
I'm not quite sure what this dot zero is, but it's saying that this moving happens because we're referencing node here. And yeah, because we're trying to pass node by value here, we really need these to be references. So I wonder if it is just a case of converting these over to be references. No, we've now got an error here. Mismatched types. So node is a boxed node. Okay. Let's see. This this isn't showing any errors in the analyzer. Cool. So all we've now got is that the next field isn't never read. But we have a peak function which gets the first element of the list if the list's empty. It returns none. If there is some content in the list, it returns some and it returns the value of the first element of the list. So that's pretty good. And this option type is wrapped around the value so that anyone calling peak actually has to do a similar kind of match operation to ensure that they handle both the case where we return none and the case where we return some. So, you know, you can't accidentally try to treat this none as if it's a value, Rust protects you from doing that. So yeah, we've wrote a peak method, looking pretty good. So the next bit of the tutorial talks about implementing a pop method. But I think we're going to leave things where they are for now. We've got a push method, we've got a peak method, we've got our initial data structures. We're using most of the fields. This, this next element is never read, but that will be read when we do add the pop method. So what I'm going to do is wrap up here. I'm going to commit this code that we've got as a partial implementation of our first linked list type. And I'm going to find a home for this code on GitLab. So let's create the git commit. So we're going to add the contents of source. We're just going to do a git diff hash just to see what's going to be added. So we're adding the contents of first.rs and we're adding this pubmod first line to lib.rs. So we're going to commit that as partial implementation of first link list type. And I'm going to go and create a project for this on GitLab and come back. So I've gone ahead and created a project on GitLab for this work and just called it Lists. This is under my Rust subgroup of projects and I'm going to put a link to this in the video description if you want to find this. I'm now going to grab the git clone URL for this and I'm going to add this to my code. So I'm going to say git remote add this git connection URL here. Oh, I need to give it a name. It does help if I remember syntax of git commands. So we're going to add that as origin and before we push this we're going to create a readme file because we always need a readme file and so we're just going to say this code was written following the tutorial learn rust with entirely too many linked lists and have a link to the front page of this tutorial that should be enough for a readme I am going to check whether there is anything on here about copyright. Probably need to go to GitHub. I 
We have an MIT license on the tutorial, so let's grab this and donk it in as the license. And I'm going to add my copyright line. So we're going to add ourselves a license, and I also always like to have a maintainers file. And the maintainers file just has name and contact email address for the maintainer of the repository. Uh, it just gives you a you know a quick reference point if you need to contact the maintainer of the project. So. We're going to say add our readme, add our maintainers file, add our license. I'm going to commit that as uh, metadata files. And I do wonder if we can add some SPDX license headers because I do like those. So we would have SPDX license item. The fire and I have that in the front of each of these files just as a way of saying hey this is MIT license code without copying the entire text of the MIT license and I reference this in some other videos I've done um, it's kind of the preferred way of doing things these days and the if we look up SPDX license identifier, we should get the SPDX license list. So this is a list of licenses and short canonical names for them. So if we find MIT in this list, we have MIT here. Cool, so that's kind of useful. So we're just going to add these headers. So we're going to have a commit it just says add SPDX license headers. And so now we've got something I'm a little happier pushing to GitLab. It's got a license, it's got license headers on the files, it's got a really basic readme. I'm referencing the upstream tutorial that I'm following. I'm happy with that, so let's go ahead and take a look. I'm just going to look at our branch name. I don't really like branch name master. I'm going to call it dev for development. And we're going to push the dev branch to origin and set that as our upstream. So let's go back to GitLab and refresh this page. And we've got our code pushed to GitLab where we want it. So that's where I'm going to leave things for now, I will include a link to this commit of this repository um, in the video description so that even if I've gone ahead and implemented more things after this, before you get to watch the video, you'll have a link to kind of the code as it was in this state. So yeah, I'm pretty happy with where we've got there. So. That's where I'm going to leave things. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like, subscribe to the channel so that you get notified when the next video in this series gets posted, and leave some comments. I really want to see some feedback on you know, what sort of stuff people find valuable and you know, what you want to see next. So that's it from me, and thank you very much.